Hollywood, or should I say Holly Weird. For decades, spooks and spirits in search of their last close-up have given new meaning to the name City of Angels. It's got to be his apparition. It's got to be his ghost, the ghost of this lost and forgotten electrician of Raleigh Studios. It seems the movie capital of the world still attracts more than just fresh-faced wannabes with drop-dead looks. You see, the stars in these stories are just plain dead. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll dig up six bone-chilling tales of film lands dearly departed. Well, they found out that that mirror originally hung in the room that was rented on an ongoing basis by Marilyn Monroe. They had it examined by many uh, paranormal psychologists and they said that it is a spirit of Marilyn Monroe. From the first time I went to J.C. Brings house, the hair stood up on my arms. It was a frightening and is a frightening place. There's something desolate and unreal about it all. We'll also explain how a deceased film producer tried to signal a starlet about her gruesome fate nearly 40 years after his own untimely demise. Maybe he sensed the arrival of yet another person who also was going to be determined to have their life terminated by less than savory means. They were both found tied and repeatedly stabbed, just as the apparition was that she had seen. And we'll step inside the haunted mansion of a former Tinseltown socialite named Daisy, who can't seem to find her way into the light. Daisy's ghost is walking the corridors of the house. You know, when a tortured soul is constantly walking up and down the halls of the place where you live, um, people are bound to be driven crazy. This show's got more dead bodies in the L.A. County morgue. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me as we scare up some of Hollywood's pesky poltergeists and famous phantoms. They're dead, but they're backed by popular demand. Hollywood ghosts. Our first story begins in the 1930s and spans nearly four decades to a bone-chilling end. Way back in 1932, Hollywood hotshot producer Paul Byrne was a big kahuna at MGM. The 42-year-old movie maker was romancing platinum-haired sexpot Jean Harlow, an actress half his age. Byrne and Harlow made an unlikely couple but were soon shacking up together. Historian and co-author of Hollywood Haunted, Mark Wanamaker. Paul Byrne built this little love nest up, up above Benedict Canyon. It was a little faux Tudor house and really cute and really tucked away in these hills and trees. But the cozy cottage quickly became a house of horrors. Aaron Kincaid lives next door to the Byrne home. Paul and Jean were married in July of 1932. By Labor Day weekend of the same year, less than eight weeks later, Paul lay dead in his bedroom, a bullet through his head. Speculation ran wild. Was Harlow involved? Was it murder? Was it suicide? Paul left a suicide note apologizing to his wife, but the story doesn't end there. Laurie Jacobson is the co-author of Hollywood Haunted. It was rumored that the night before Paul Byrne died, Dorothy Millette, his common-law wife, paid him a visit and made demands upon him to do right by her. And there was an argument and some people believe that Dorothy Millett murdered Paul Byrne. Unfortunately, Millett was um, unavailable for questioning. Her lifeless body was found washed up on the shore of the Sacramento River days later. Now here's where the tale takes an eerie twist. In the mid-60s, hairdresser to the stars Jay Sebring purchased the Byrne home despite its unsettling history. At the time, Sebring was dating a sexy young actress named Sharon Tate. Sharon Tate was staying at the house one evening while Jay Sebring was away. She was awakened by a knocking sound and confronted what she thought was Paul Byrne. She is shocked. He doesn't seem to see her. He walks by the bed over to a desk. Sharon is so frightened, she slips out of bed and she's running down the stairs to the first floor. And there on the stairway, she sees the ghastly apparition of a person tied up with their throat cut. She ran to the bar to fix herself a drink. She clawed and toyed at the wallpaper. She consumed the liquor, went back up to bed. When she awoke in the morning, she thought it was a horrible dream she'd had. 
That is, until she returned to the bar and saw the wallpaper with the claw marks on it. I could use a drink myself. Tate was so freaked out by the apparition, she told some friends about the sighting. Dr. Barry Taff is a parapsychologist who has investigated thousands of hauntings. The reason Paul Byrne may have been haunting the house is that if he died a violent death or an untimely death there, that is the most common reason why people haunt an environment. But what about the gory figure Sharon saw tied to the staircase? Sharon Tate's uh, experience strongly suggests the possibility that she had a vision of her impending demise. Cut to August 8, 1969, one of the most infamous nights in Hollywood history. At the time, Sharon Tate was married to director Roman Polanski and eight months pregnant with their first child. The couple was renting a home in Benedict Canyon, just down the road from the Paul Byrne house. While Polanski was on location shooting a movie, Sharon's former boyfriend, Jay Sebring, and a few friends were keeping the actress company. During the night, cult leader Charles Manson's family of freaks broke into Sharon's house in a bloodthirsty frenzy. Both she and Jay were murdered that night in 1969 by the Manson family. They were both found tied and repeatedly stabbed, just as the apparition was that she had seen. A total of five people were brutally killed that night in Benedict Canyon. Manson and company were arrested in December of 1969 and sent to the slammer for good. Maybe Paul Byrne's ghost was trying to warn Sharon about the murders that night. Who knows? Up next, two untimely deaths linked to the ghastly goings-on in a pair of Hollywood's oldest studios. Hollywood is a town filled with superstars, superstitions, and the supernatural. For as many movie studios as there are scattered around the city, just as many tales exist about strange hauntings by actors, studio heads, and even behind-the-scenes crew members. Raleigh Studios, being one of the oldest in Hollywood and continuous operation, of course has its stories. In 1932, it was always known that an electrician had fallen in stage five from the rafters to his death on the studio floor. But I guess no one told the guy he was dead. His spirit is still flipping switches and shocking workers at the studio. Soundstage number five at Raleigh Studios is notorious for the ghostly goings on in there. 300 pound lights will suddenly start swinging at the top of the rafters and just as suddenly come to a halt. Footsteps will be heard on the empty sound stage. Music has come out of the walls there when nothing is on the site. In 1994, Dr. Barry Taff was brought in to investigate the hauntings at Raleigh Studios. I knew nothing about the place and I'm just walking through and suddenly I felt very disoriented, falling back to my left and I, I almost fell and hit the floor and I later learned that in this particular location someone had fallen off one of the uh, catwalks there and, and died. It's got to be his apparition, it's got to be his ghost, the ghost of this lost and forgotten electrician of Raleigh Studios. On the other side of town a fellow by the name of Thomas Ince is still making a stir at Culver Studios. Thomas Ince in his day was one of the biggest and most important respected moguls of filmmaking. Thomas Ince was lured to Culver City by Harry Culver and uh, it was Thomas Ince who built the first studio, the first enterprise of filmmaking in Culver City in 1915. Ince poured his blood, sweat and tears into Culver Studios which became a filmmaking powerhouse. Ince was a good friend of William Randolph Hearst, two very powerful men on the west coast. On Thomas Ince's birthday in 1924, William Randolph Hearst offered to throw him a party aboard his yacht. Reportedly, Ince had a pretty severe bleeding ulcer and was instructed by his doctors to lay off the booze and rich food. But Ince failed to heed the advice while living it up aboard the Hearst party boat. There was drinking of wine, there was the, the, the feasting, the talking, all, all of this going on. And after the evening, he had a very serious uh, ulcer attack. Uh, he was vomiting blood, he was uh, really in a serious state and then had a coronary on top of it. He died at home several days later in front of his whole family. Ince was only 43. The mogul was still a young man and I guess he wasn't quite ready to give up control of his studio. In 1988, during some renovations, Ince paid an unexpected visit to the set. He walked up to two workmen who were in the act of tearing down Ince's number one stage 
walked right up to them and said, I don't like what you're doing to my studio. Then he turned and walked away through a wall. The appearance was no special effect. Eugene Hilchey worked at Culver Studios in the prop department. Well, the man walked out, he was just shaking. He went to the studio manager, and the studio manager said, hold on a minute, and he laid three pictures out on his desk, and he said, do uh, you recognize any of these three men? He pointed right to Thomas Ince. Scared yet? Well, we've got more horror stories on the way. When we come back, find out what event woke Marilyn Monroe and Montgomery Cliff from the dead, and why a loudmouth comic had some angry spirits rolling in the aisle. In 1927, the hippest of Hollywood's landmarks opened its doors. The $3.5 million Roosevelt Hotel boasted a ballroom supper club where guests could dance the night away. In fact, the place was so dazzling, some of its earliest residents still don't want to check out. Roosevelt Hotel historian J.D. Kessler. It was the first major construction project in Hollywood land, which is what Hollywood was called originally. It was a development that was established so that it would be a community to be built around a new industry. The very first Academy Awards ceremony was held in the Blossom Room at the Roosevelt in 1929. The posh hotel soon became the swankiest hangout on Hollywood Boulevard. Movie stars like Charlie Chaplin, Greta Garbo, Montgomery Clift, and Marilyn Monroe were regular guests. The Roosevelt remained a grand place to go through the 50s, and then it, it began to fade. It was owned by many different people, its glamour and beauty was covered up. The hotel underwent major renovations in 1984, and that's when the spooks began to crawl out of the woodwork. When there's remodeling or building or renovation, whatever this is, whatever this phenomena is in, na in, its, in nature, it doesn't like it. It reacts. Before the Roosevelt reopened, the maid was cleaning a mirror when she noticed something strange. She saw the reflection of a blonde woman in the mirror. She knew that it was no one supposed to be in the hotel. She turned to ask the person why they were there, and there was no one there. She turned back to the mirror, and there was the blonde woman still standing there. So, oh, I'm getting kind of chills. They found out that that mirror originally hung in the room that was rented on an ongoing basis by Marilyn Monroe. They had it examined by many a paranormal psychologist, and they said that it is a spirit of Marilyn Monroe. And the screen goddess isn't the only one still knocking around her old haunt. There is a, a spirit in room 928. The people that stay there will often hear someone playing the trumpet. Montgomery Clift lived in room 928 at the Roosevelt for about three months when he was shooting From Here to Eternity. He needed to play a bugle for that role and he often practiced in his room. Of course, the ghosts of Monty and Marilyn have been seen in practically every old hotel and bar in Hollywood. I swear, those two get around more than Elvis. But the Roosevelt Hotel is just one site to spot celebrity specters. Back in the 1940s and 50s, Ciro's was the place to see and be seen by Tinseltown's Glitterati. Ciro's nightclub on the Sunset Strip is one of the most famous of all of the nightclubs, really, on the Strip. During the night spot's heyday, mobster Mickey Cohen muscled his way into the action. Mickey Cohen was the top gangster in Los Angeles. He pretty much replaced Bugsy Siegel after Bugsy was killed. Mickey Cohen was so big in town, and particularly on the Sunset Strip. Mickey was known to occasionally uh, conduct a little business at Ciro's, if you catch my drift. Ciro's closed in 1959, but reopened in 72 as the now famous Comedy Store. But it seems that some of the old customers keep coming back for more. Comedian Argus Hamilton has worked at the Comedy Store since 1976. The basement was rumored to be a place where the wise guys uh, in Los Angeles would bump people off. And there's a lot of belief that the basement ghosts tend to be some of the knocked off mobsters. I used to be a waitress at the Comedy Store. We had so many reports of paranormal activity in the club that in the early 80s we called UCLA's parapsychological department to come in and investigate. Some psychics believe that ghosts endlessly reenact the traumatic details of their death. I believe that someone was dragged down into the basement against his will and was killed. This spirit is so angry about what happened to him, he is held there 
and he is still really angry. Once again, parapsychologist Dr. Barry Taff was on the scene. I was at the comedy store, closing my briefcase, and I look up to my right, and I see men standing there staring at me. They all wore double-breasted pinstripe suits and hats, uh, more in like the 30s or 40s, gangster clothing. I closed my briefcase, started to turn, and they were gone. But the poltergeist at the comedy store don't just hang out in the basement, as one popular comedian found out. The late Sam Kennison, whom we loved, and was frequently here late, late, late at night with us, was a very connected spiritual person. They hated Sam's act. They would do anything they could to stop him. And he knew this, he was aware of this, and he often called out challenges to the spirits when he was on stage. Come on, if you're here, show me something. And boom, all the lights in, this, in the place would go out. Or the microphone would go dead. Man, talk about a tough crowd. Kinnison might be the only comic to be heckled by the dead people. Unfortunately, the controversial comedian was killed in a car wreck in 1992. When we come back, our final ghost story takes place right here. It's a Hollywood-style haunting complete with sex, debauchery, scandal, and maybe even murder. During the early days of Hollywood, Latin leading man Antonio Moreno and his wife, oil heiress Daisy Canfield Danziger, were one of the town's hottest couples. In 1923, the newlyweds built this 22-room Spanish-style mansion on four acres of property high atop the hills of Silver Lake. They dubbed the estate Crestmount. Silver Lake historian Todd Hughes. Crestmount quickly became established as the social hub of East Hollywood. Crestmount archivist Mike Schmidt. Daisy and Antonio uh, would entertain mostly on Sundays and they would invite both the uh, people from industry, for people that Daisy knew from the oil business, and people from the Hollywood film colony. And they would they'd come up here and swim. And uh, you also have to remember this was during Prohibition. So there was uh, a certain amount of um, drinking going on. And to actually come here to Crestmount during that time was uh, considered uh, sort of a prized invitation. There's a wine cellar in the basement of Crestmount where Antonio used to lead tours during his parties and he would bring more lovely women attending down to the wine cellar to look at his incredible um, stash of fine wines. Yeah, and I'll bet that's not all they were looking at. Moreno had a pension for pretty young girls and Daisy wasn't too keen about her husband's philandering. At first, they were very passionate in the relationship, but as time went on, um, and Antonio's star just kept rising. He became a bigger and bigger star throughout the 20s. And Daisy began to resent the fact that he would spend these long days on the set in the arms of Hollywood's most beautiful women. One thing led to another, and the couple split in 1931, but never divorced. Daisy turned to booze, naturally, to drown her sorrows. She donated the infamous mansion to the Roman Catholic Church, who turned the property into a home for wayward girls. In 1933, it would have been the 10-year anniversary of their marriage. Daisy was driving along Mulholland Drive when her chauffeur-driven limousine plummeted over a 300-foot cliff and killed her instantly. Miraculously, however, the chauffeur lived. Now, of course, there was lots of speculation of how she died. Was it a crash? Was it an accident? Or was it some sort of foul play on behalf of Antonio Moreno that possibly maybe got rid of her and staged this whole thing. It's still a mystery to this day. Turns out that the chauffeur driving her on Mulholland Drive happened to be a distant relative of Antonio Moreno himself. Hmm, what a coincidence. No will was found. And so uh, Antonio received um, half of her estate. It was interesting, though, that some family members did find some notes on how she wanted her cremation to happen and what kind of ceremony she wanted. One of the relatives explained this by the fact that Daisy sought the advice of uh, spiritualists occasionally and had known of her impending death. But to this day, Daisy just can't seem to give up the ghost. When Daisy was having her early problems with Antonio, she would spend long days pacing the halls of Crestmount waiting for Antonio to get home, torturing herself with the ideas of him in the arms of Greg Garbo, Clara Bow. So perhaps when she died such a violent death, 
her spirit naturally drifted back to Crestmount, where she continued to pace the halls and wait for Antonio to come home. There seems to be a, uh, a variety of spirits up here. Daisy is reported to be up here. Antonio is uh, roaming around up here. It seems that the north wing of the house seems to be the most active part of the house. There's a lot of reports of footsteps, of apparition of someone turning a corner, of people talking. The north wing is where Antonio and Daisy's rooms were. I would hear stories from neighbors about seeing things that weren't there a minute later, um, hearing strange noises coming from the empty house. People still talk about the haunted house at the top of the hill. There you have it, folks. In a town that thrives on make-believe, sometimes it's the true stories that really are stranger than fiction. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we shed some light on the dark side of Hollywood. The very concept of a ghost implies that something survives physical, corporeal death. S spirit, soul, consciousness. Something we might want to call discarnate intelligence. Discarnate meaning without body. The question is, what is that? What is it that survives? Does it go to heaven? Does it go to hell? Does it go to another reality?